XXIX. Back to Bengal. The whole of the Bengal presidency was alive with enthusiasm over the news that Swami Vivekananda had landed in India. Calcutta in particular was following with intense interest the movements and utterances of the Swami's triumphal progress from Colombo to Madras. A reception committee was formed with the Maharaja Bahadur of Darbhanga as president to receive him officially and to arrange for a public reception. The Swami was looking forward eagerly to his return to the city of his birth. The boat trip from Madras was a boon to his tired nerves. For the continuous ovations, public speaking and talking to visitors had worn him out. It was to escape all this that he decided to travel by boat instead of by train. Before leaving Madras, some of his admirers ordered a huge number of coconuts to be brought on board, the milk of which the Swami was to drink by the doctor's orders. Mrs. Sevier, on seeing the quantity of coconuts asked, Swami, is this a freight boat that they are loading so many coconuts aboard? He, very much amused, replied, Why, no, not at all. They are my coconuts. A doctor has advised me to drink coconut milk instead of water. He shared the fruit with the captain and his fellow passengers. When the steamer sailed up the Hoogli, the Swami pointed out to his disciples all the places of interest that he knew so well, as well as the places associated with his early youth and manhood. The reception committee at Calcutta had been busy ever since the Swami had left Madras and when the steamer docked at Kiddarpur, there was a special train waiting to take him the following morning to the Sialda station. At about half past seven o'clock in the morning the Swami and his party boarded the train. Thousands of people were gathered at the Sialda station, Calcutta, from early morning to greet him. They were reading as they waited, Copies of the two farewell addresses of his students in New York and London which were being distributed. When the whistle of the train was heard, a shout of joy rang out. When the train stopped, the Swami stood up and bowed to the multitude with joined palms. When he stepped from the carriage, those nearest him made a rush to take the dust off his feet, those further off shouted his name and that of his master triumphantly. So dense were the crowds that it was with exceeding difficulty that the reception committee headed by Mr. Narendra Nath Sain, the editor of the Indian Mirror, could make way for the Swami to the carriage that was waiting for him. Many sannyasins, in their Gerua robes, were in the crowd, some of them being his own Gurubhais. The Swami was literally loaded with garlands of sweet flowers and was visibly moved by the tremendous demonstration. Hardly had the Swami with Mr. and Mrs. Sevier seated himself in the landau, when the horses were unharnessed and a band of Bengali boys, mostly students, fislied forward to draw the carriage. A procession was then formed, headed by a band playing lively music, which moved in the direction of the Ripon College, its first stopping place. A Sankirtana party followed at some distance in the rear singing religious songs with visible emotion, which lent added interest to the great occasion. Along the line of march the streets were decorated with flags and banners, flowers and evergreens. In circular road a triumphal arch of welcome was erected, bearing the inscription, Hail Swamiji. In Harrison Road there was another with the salutation, Jai Ramakrishna. And another still was constructed in front of the Ripon College bearing the word, Welcome at the college itself there was a wild demonstration. Thousands had flocked thither to get a close view of the great sannyasin. Still thousands more pressed towards the college in the line of the procession until a panic seemed imminent. At the college an informal reception was held, the Swami replying briefly, as the reception committee had decided to postpone the public reception until a week later, so as to afford the citizens of Calcutta a more favourable opportunity of hearing him. After a short time, therefore, the Swami and his party left for Baglibjar, 
where they had been invited to a banquet by Rai Pasliukti Nath Bose at his palatial residence. At four o'clock in the afternoon, the Swami and his European disciples were driven to the beautiful riverside residence of Gopal Le Seal in Kos Sipore, known as Seal's Garden, which was offered to the Swami and his friends for their temporary residence. Continually, day after day, and every hour of the day, hundreds of people came to pay their personal respects to the Swami and to hear his exposition of Vedanta. Telegrams of congratulation and of welcome and also invitations from various towns came pouring in. In the daytime he made his headquarters generally at the Kosipore mansion, at night Lai stayed at the Math which was then at Alambazar. The Swami had no rest. The task of receiving and entertaining countless visitors and the constant discussion on strenuous intellectual subjects which such visits entailed were a great strain. 28 February 1897 was the day arid the place chosen was the palatial residence of Raja Sir Radhakanta Dev Bahadur at Sog Bazar for the presentation of the city's address of welcome. When the Swami arrived, he was cordially welcomed by the most distinguished audience that had ever assembled in that historic capital of the British Empire in India. At least 5,000 people had gathered in the inner quadrangle and verandas all around, and the cheering which was evoked by his appearance was deafening. The meeting was presided over by Raja Binov Krishna Dev Bahadur, who introduced the Swami as the foremost national figure in the life of India. There were present Rajas and Maharajas, Sannyasins, a group of distinguished Europeans, many well-known Pandits, illustrious citizens and hundreds of college students. The address of welcome was presented in a silver casket to the Swami, who replied in a speech that has become famous as a masterpiece of oratory and of fervent patriotism. This brought him recognition, in an especial sense, as the prophet of modern India. He had defined in a new form the whole scope of Indian consciousness and had given birth to entirely new ideas of national and public life. In this address one finds his own master, Sri Ramakrishna. Parmahimsa, proclaimed by him as God incarnate, and held by him before the nation as a great spiritual ideal manifested for the good of all races and of all religions. The spirit of this lecture and of the Swami himself made the profoundest impression which has widened and deepened with the years, producing a new order in modern India. Shortly after the Swami's arrival in Calcutta, the birthday anniversary of Sri Ramakrishna came off. It was celebrated as was usual at the time, at Dakshineswar, but the fact that Swami Vivekananda himself was to take part in the festival drew large crowds to the temple of the Mother. Accompanied by some of his Gurubhais, the Swami arrived at the temple garden at about 9 o'clock in the morning. He was barefooted, dressed in a long alkhalla and wore a Gerua turban. The great multitude catching sight of him cried out the name of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda repeatedly. Vast crowds eager to see him and to take the dust of his feet thronged about him and followed him wherever he went. After a while he repaired to the temple of the mother, followed by great numbers, there before the image he prostrated himself bowing his head to the ground in adoration, in company with the swarming crowd. The Swami next visited the shrine of Sri Radha Kantaji and then entered Sri Ramakrishna's room, which was full of devotees. Scores of Sankirtana parties were everywhere singing and dancing in the name of the Lord. Triumphant shouts of Jai Ramakrishna echoed and re-echoed from one kamar of the vast temple garden to the other, as though on a pilgrimage, the Swami visited with great reverence the various places of religious interest accompanied by his European disciples who had come just then. He walked to the memorable Panchavati tree, the meditation seat and place of illumination of the Parmahamsa Deva, where he read a hymn to Sri Ramakrishna in Sanskrit, which was given to him by the composer. 
Around the Panchavati, there were scores of devotees of the great master, but among them all, the Swami singled out Girish Chandra Ghosh. The two exchanged greetings and the Swami comparing the present occasion with the former days when only a few attracted by the unique life of the Divine Master celebrated the birthday festival, said, Well, what a difference between those days and these. I know that, but still there arises the desire to see more, replied the great dramatist, quoting from one of the epics, where the bhaktas longed to live on, even though miserable and afflicted, so that they might see more and more of the glories of the Leela or Divine Career of the Lord Incarnate. The Swami then turned His steps in the direction of the Bilva tree, another scene of the austerities of Sri Ramakrishna. The great masses that had congregated at the Dakshineswar Turnpal Garden called upon Him repeatedly to tell them of His Master. He made an effort to speak, but His voice was drowned in the tumult. Seeing that it was impossible to make himself heard, he gave up the attempt and mingled with the crowd for some time, exchanging friendly greetings and occasionally introducing his English disciples to distinguished bhaktas of his master. Towards three o'clock in the afternoon, when the crowd had thinned, he returned to the Alambazar mat, in company with a Guru Bhai and a disciple. On the way he talked to the latter of the necessity of religious festivals and other demonstrations of religious zeal and emotion for the general masses who cannot comprehend abstract ideas of truth. A few days after his reply to the address of welcome by the Calcutta public, the Swami again lectured before it on A.I. the Vedanta in all its phases. This address was another of those masterpieces of philosophical dissertation which mark his progress from Colombo to Almora. Taking his stand upon the unassailable ground that the Vedas and the Upanishads are the basis of all systems of philosophy or religion in India, he touched upon the Sankhya, Yoga and Ramanuj systems, showing them as classifications of the Vedsanta, and maintained that before Hindus were to be known even as Hindus, they must first of all be Vedantins. He pointed out that the Vedanta is the climax of systems of philosophy and religion and stressed the necessity of renunciation. And in this lecture, as in others, he put before his hearers the glory of the Sanatna Dharma and the greatness of the Upanishads and Vedanta. With them as foundation he felt that Hinduism could be restored to a vigorous life. He denounced hypocrisy and fanaticism. He contrasted the degenerating influence of the Vamachara practices of the Tantras with the strengthening and ennobling power of the Upanishadic teachings. The Vedanta, he felt, should be the background of everything in India. 7. His spirit permeated his entire discourse. This address created a profound impression in the metropolis. The citizens came to understand now more fully that the Swami stood for the true spirit and the essentials of the Vedic Dharma. The beautiful eclecticism of the Vedanta as presented by the Swami appealed most to all. During the Swami's stay in Calcutta, though he made his headquarters at the Seals Mansion and the Alambazar Math, Yet he was constantly visiting one devotee of Sri Ramakrishna or another. He was entertained frequently by one or other of the princes of the metropolis, but he was also the guest of the most humble. Many distinguished people, persons of various professions and callings as well as hundreds of enthusiastic youths and college students used to come daily to the seal's garden. Among the former some came to him out of curiosity, some thirsting for knowledge, and others to test his learning and powers. The questioners were invariably charmed with his knowledge and interpretation of the Shastras, and even great masters of philosophy and university professors were amazed at his genius. But his heart was with the educated, unmarried youths with whom he was never tired of speaking. He was consumed with the desire for infusing his own spirit into them and to train some of the more energetic and religious among them, 
so that they might devote their lives to the salvation of their own souls and to the good of the world. He did not speak to them always on spiritual topics, nor was he too generous with his praise. He deplored their physical weakness, denounced early marriage, admonished them for their lack of faith in themselves and in their national culture and ideals, but all this was done with such unmistakable love and kindness that they became his staunchest disciples and followers. A few excerpts from the Swami's general conversations and descriptions of the private meetings in the Seals Garden and elsewhere, as recorded by them, will be interesting and instructive to the readers, as showing the depth and the breadth of his vision and his teachings. Some followers of the Krishna cult in Bengal, led by the erroneous impression that the Swami in his zeal for Vedantism did not present before the Western world that other aspect of Hinduism known as Vaishnavism, had tried during his absence in the West to make the most of this matter in order to belittle his mission in the eyes of his countrymen. But the Swami's own words gave the lie to these libels. In the course of an eloquent talk on the Vaishnav faith with one of its followers, he said, Babaji, once I gave a lecture in America on Shri Krishna. It made such an impression on a young and beautiful woman, heiress to immense wealth, that she renounced everything and retired to a solitary island where she passed her days absorbed in meditation on Shri Krishna. Speaking of renunciation, he said further, Slow but sure degradation creeps into those sects which do not practice and preach the spirit of renunciation. One day the Swami was talking with a young man who lived at the Bengal Theosophical Society. The latter said, Swamiji, I frequent various sects but cannot decide what is truth. The Swami replied in a most affectionate way, My boy, you need have no fear, I was also once in the same state. Tell me what people of different faiths have instructed you and how you have followed their injunctions. The youth then said that a learned preacher of the Theosophical Society had clearly convinced him of the truth and utility of image worship and that he had accordingly done puja and japa for a long time with great devotion but could not find peace. Then someone had advised him to try to make the mind void in times of meditation. He had struggled hard to do so, but still the mind did not become calm and controlled. Sir, said the young man, still I sit in meditation, shutting the door of my room and closing my eyes as long as I can, but I cannot find peace of mind. Can you show me the way? My boy, spoke the Swami in a voice full of loving sympathy, If you take my word, you will have first of all to open the door of your room and look around instead of closing your eyes. There are hundreds of poor and helpless people in the neighborhood of your house, them you have to serve to the best of your ability. One who is ill and has no one to look after him, for him you will have to get medicine and diet and nurse him. One who has nothing to eat, you will have to feed him. One who is ignorant, you will have to teach him, well educated as you are. My advice to you is, if you want peace of mind, you have to serve others in this way as best as you can. But the questioner began to argue, but suppose, sir, if in going to nurse a patient I myself fall ill through loss of sleep and irregular meals as well as by other irregularities, dot. The Swami replied rather sharply, Why boy, it is quite evident from your words and manners to every one present here that people like you, who are so mindful of their own bodily comforts, will never go out of your way or risk your health to nurse the sick. Another day, in course of a conversation, a distinguished disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, a professor of long standing, asked him, You talk of service, charity and doing good to the world, those are, after all, in the domain of Maya. When, according to Vedanta, the goal of man is the attainment of mukti by breaking all the bondage of Maya, 
what is the use of preaching things which keep the mind on mundane matters? Without a moment's hesitation the Swami replied, Is not the idea of Mukti also in the domain of Maya? Does not the Vedanta teach that the Atman is ever free? What is striving for Mukti to the Atman, then? With the nation at his feet, with name and fame and wealth heaped upon him, Swami Vivekananda was the same simple sannyasin as of old, untouched by pride and conceit. One day, the nephew of Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramlal Chattopadliaya, or Ramlal Dada as he is enduringly called by the offered Ramlal Dada his chair. Ramlal Dada out of humility and disconcerted at taking the Swami's chair in the presence of visitors, asked the Swami to resume his seat, but unsuccessfully. After much persuasion the Swami made him sit in the chair and strolled about the room saying to himself, Guruvat Guru Pitrasliu, one should treat the relations of the Guru with the same honour as one would treat the Guru himself. This incident, though a simple one, was a lesson in Guru Bhakti to those who witnessed it. In these days the Swami's moods varied according to the different temperaments of His visitors. On one occasion someone knowing His regard for the imitation of Christ and its saintly author referred to the wonderful humility which pervaded the teachings of that classical work and observed that spiritual progress was impossible unless one thought of oneself as the lowest of the low star. The Swami exclaimed, why should W.C. think ourselves as low and reproach ourselves? Where is darkness for us? We are verily the sons of light. We live and move and have our being in the light which lightedly the whole universe. Once while discoursing on the conquest of lust, the Swami mentioned a personal instance which gives a hint as to what lengths he himself had gone rather than submit to the lower nature. In the days of my youth, he said, once I was so much troubled with a fit of passion that I became terribly vexed with myself and in my rage sat upon a pot of burning charcoal that was nearby. It took many days to heal the wound. An inquirer one day asked the Swami about the difference between an incarnation and a liberated soul. Without giving a direct answer to the question, he said, my conclusion is that liberation is the highest stage. When I used to roam about all over India in my sadhana stage, I passed days and days in solitary caves in meditation and many a time decided to starve myself to death because I could not attain mukti. Now I have no desire for mukti. I do not care for it so long as one single individual in the universe remains without attaining it. These words of unbounded love for all beings remind one of a similar utterance of the Lord Buddha. But it must be remembered that both these great teachers of humanity spoke thus only after they had attained to illumination. Only prophets and saviors of mankind can challenge mukti in that manner. Therein is the difference between an ordinary liberated soul and an incarnation or one who having mukti in the palm of his hand, as it were, refuses to be merged in the absolute or the essence of God himself, but lives in the world for the good of others, to raise them to the highest slate. It was at the home of Sri Priyanath Mukherjee that he said to the editor of the Indian Mirror that his preaching of Vedanta in the West had convinced him that all methods of raising the motherland such as politics were but secondary to the necessity of clinging to her scriptures and obeying the injunctions thereof. After the distinguished visitor had left, the Swami had the following conversation with a preacher of the Cow Protection Society which brings out in bold relief his love for his fellow beings and his patriotism. Swamiji, what is the aim of your association? Preacher, we save our Gomatas, cows regarded as mother, from the hands of the butchers by buying them. We have established refuges where old, diseased and disabled cows are taken care of. Swamiji, that is an excellent idea. What is the source of your income? 
preacher the work is managed by gifts given by high minded persons like you swami ji what funds have you preacher the merchants are the chief supporters and patrons of the society they have helped it with large contributions of money swami ji a terrible famine has been raging in central india the government of india have published a report computing the death rate from starvation at 900000 is your society doing anything to save these starving people from the jaws of death preacher we do not help in famines and the like our object is to save the gomatas only swami ji when lakhs and lakhs of your own countrymen and coreligionists are succumbing to this dreadful famine do you not think it your duty to help these miserable creatures by giving them a morsel of food preacher no this famine has broken out as a result of their karma their sins it is a case of like karma like fruit dot hearing these words the dot swarms face became flushed and his eyes glared at the speaker but suppressing his emotions he exclaimed sir i have no sympathy with such organizations which do not feel for man which seeing before their eyes thousands of their famished brothers perishing from starvation do not care to save them by offering even a morsel of food but spend millions for the protection of birds and beasts i do not believe any public good worth the name can come out of such societies men are dying through their karma so let them die are you not ashamed to make such a cruel statement if you make the plea of the doctrine of karma in that way then there is no need of any endeavor to do good to others it may be equally applied to your work the cows fall into the hands of the butchers and are slaughtered by them as a result of their own karma in this or in some past lives and so there is no need of our doing anything for them the preacher feeling thoroughly discomfited said of course what you say is true but our shastras say the cow is our mother dot amused at these words the swami said yes that cow is our mother i can very well understand otherwise who else will give birth to such talented sons perhaps this biting joke was lost upon this preacher for he without making any remark now asked the swami for a contribution he replied I am a sanyasin as you see if people give me money i shall first of all spend it in the service of man i shall try to save men first by making provision to give them food education and religion if after spending money on these things there be any left i shall give something out of it to your society after the preacher had left the swami said to those about him what nonsense that man talked what is the use of helping those who are dying due to their own karma that is the reason why the country has gone to rack and ruin did you see to what a monstrous extreme your doctrine of karma is dragged alas are they men who have no heart to feel for man as he spoke his whole body shook with grief and disgust but one might go on endlessly quoting from these conversations and dialogues they are an inspiration for young india surcharged as they are with unbounded love of country fellowmen and religion strength strength is the one word he said in one of his madras lectures that every line of the upanishads declares unto me to make every indian conscious of the infinite power of the spirit lying potential in every man he regarded as the foremost mission of his life for out of it came everything that made religion dynamic life giving and man making talking one day to a disciple he said it is rebellion against nature struggle for self preservation that differentiates spirit from matter where there is life there is struggle there is the manifestation of the spirit read the history of all nations and you will find that that is the law it is only this nation which drifts with nature 
and you are more dead than alive. Yon are in a hypnotized state. For the last thousand years or more, you are told that you are weak, you are nobodies, you are good for nothing and so on, and you have come to believe yourselves as such. This body of mine was also born and bred on Indian soil, but I have never for a moment allowed such baneful ideas to enter my mind. I had tremendous faith in myself. It is because of that, by the grace of the Lord, that those who look down upon us as weak and low. Regard me as their teacher. If you have the same faith in yourselves as I had, if you can believe that in you is infinite power, unbounded wisdom, indomitable energy, if you can rouse that power in yourselves, you will be like me, you will do wonders. You will say, where is that strength in us to be able to think like that? And where are the teachers to tell us not of weakness but of strength and rouse in us that faith? It is to teach you that and to show you the way by my life that I have come to you. From me you must learn and realize that truth, and then go from town to town, from village to village, from door to door, and scatter the idea broadcast. Go and tell every Indian. Arise, awake and dream no moral rouse thyself and manifest the divinity within. There is no want, there is no misery that you cannot remove by the consciousness of the power of the Spirit within. Believe in these words and you will be omnipotent. At their very first meeting the Swami had spoken to this disciple in Sanskrit and taking him apart had addressed him with that memorable sliloka of the Vivekashidmani of Shankaracharya which runs thus. Fear not, O wise one, there is no death for thee. There is a way of crossing this ocean of samsara. That very path by which the self-controlled sages have reached to the other side of its shore, I shall point out to thee. At the seal's garden and at the Alambazar math learned pandits came to test his knowledge of the Vedanta philosophy to meet him on his own ground and test him if they could. An incident of this character took place at the seal's garden. A group of Gujarati Pandits, well versed in the Vedas and the Darshanas, came to discuss the Shastras with him. Thinking that the Swami, because of his absence in the West, had lost his fluency in Sanskrit, they spoke to him in that classic language. The Swami replied in a calm and dignified way to their excited arguments, speaking all the while the purest Sanskrit. Only once did he hear, using the word asti for swasti. The Pandits laughed aloud making much of this trifling mistake. The Swami corrected himself at once, saying, I am the servant of the Pandits. May they allow this mistake to be overlooked. The subjects of the discussion were numerous and varied, but the main topic was the respective position of the Purva and the Uttarami Masa. The Swami supported the Uttarami Masa and with such power of logic and language that the Pandits themselves admitted the superiority of the Gyankanda. As they left, they remarked to a group of the Swami's admirers that though, perhaps, he had not a thorough mastery over Sanskrit grammar, he was undoubtedly a seer of the inmost spirit of the Shastras over which he had an extraordinary command. In discussion he is unique, they said, and the way in which he summarizes his ideas and refutes those of his opponents is wonderful. Marvelous are his intellectual gifts. When the Pandits had gone, the Swami referring to the incivility on the part of the Pandits, remarked that in the West such conduct would not be tolerated. Civilized society in the West, asterisk he said, takes the spirit of an argument and never seeks to pick holes in the language of an opponent or put to one side the subject matter in order to make fun over a grammatical mistake. Our Pandits lose sight of the spirit in quibbling over the letter of the Dharma. They fight over the husks and blinded by argumentation do not see the kernel of the cone. What love the Guru Bhais of the Swami bore to him.
while the discussion was going on. Swami Ramakrishnananda was seen sitting apart in meditation posture, counting his beads. He was praying with his whole heart to the Lord, he said later on, so that the Swami might come out victorious in the discussion. Another interesting occurrence of this time was a visit from two gentlemen who came with a disciple of the Swami to ask him some questions on pranayam, which had been aroused in their minds by reading Raja Yoga. The Swami at once recognized one of them as a fellow student of His and made them sit by Him. After replying to a few questions put by some of the other visitors, He began to speak on the subject of pranayam without being asked. First of all He explained through modern science the origin of matter from mind and by drawing contrasts between the laws of matter and of mind, showed the action and reaction of thought on form, and vice versa. He then went on to elucidate what Pradyama really was. From three o'clock in the afternoon until seven in the evening, the discourse continued. From what was heard from him that day, it seemed to all that only a very little part of his knowledge of yoga had been given out in his book, that his was not mere book learning, but proceeded from realization. What astounded the visitors most, however, was that the Swami should have known that they had come to Him to inquire about Pranayam and solved their doubts in anticipation. Subsequently, when a disciple asked about it, the Swami replied, Similar incidents have happened many times in the West and people have often asked me how I could know the questions that were agitating their minds. The talk then drifted to thought reading and the recollections of past births and various other yoga powers. One of the party asked him outright, Well, Swamiji, do you know your own past births? Instantly he answered, Yes, I do. But when they pressed him to draw aside the curtain and reveal the past so that they might see who he was in other lives, he said, I can know them, I do know them but I prefer not to say anything on the point. One evening he was seated with the Swami Premananda in a room, conversing in an ordinary way, when suddenly he became silent. After a while he said to his Guru Bhai, Did you see anything? To which he received a negative answer. Then he said that he had just seen a ghost, with his head severed from the body, beseeching him with an agonizing look to relieve him of his misery. On inquiry it was found that in that very garden house, many years ago, a Brahman who was accustomed to lend money at high rates of interest, had had his throat cut by a debtor and his body thrown in the Ganga. There were several other occasions when the Swami was visited by similar apparitions, on such occasion, he would raise his heart in prayer for their deliverance and send them his benediction. It goes without saying that the main interest of the Swami's stay in Calcutta centered round the monastery which was then located at Alambazar near Dakshineswar. No words can describe the joy of the monks of Ramakrishna when their beloved Naran was with them again. Memories of the olden days were revived. The days with the Master and the innumerable experiences of the wandering life of every one were recalled, and the Swami entertained His Guru Bhais and the Bhaktas of the Lord with hundreds of tales and episodes of His life and work in the dim and distant West. He freed them of many of their social inhibitions by making them accept His European disciples in the Brotherhood, and gradually overcame their objections to association with the Westerners. The Swami had finally the satisfaction of seeing His Guru Bhais entertaining His disciples from across the seas as their real brethren. Of the Swami's numerous triumphs, one of the greatest was the conversion of His Guru Bhais from individualistic to the universal idea of religious life in which public spirit and service to fellow men occupied a prominent place. Up to this time the ideal of the monks of the math was to strive for personal mukti and realization of the Supreme Atman by severe penance and meditation, 
remaining as much as possible aloof from the world and its cares and sorrows, according to the prevailing Hindu idea, sanctified by tradition and sanctioned by the sages and seers from the Vedic period down to the present day. But with the appearance of the Swami among them, a new order of things was inaugurated. He railed at them, as he had done again and again in his epistles to them from the West, for their lack of faith in themselves and in the great mission of the Master, for their failure to organize themselves into an active body, and for their neglect in preaching the gospel of liberation to others. He appealed to their innate strength, calling them spiritual lions, every one capable of moving the world, if he but used his latent powers. The age demanded, he said, that they should carry the new light unto others, that they themselves should show by their example how to serve the poor, the helpless and the diseased, seeing God in them, and that they should inspire others to do the same. The mission of his life, he said, was to create a new order of sannyasins in India who would dedicate their lives to help and save others. The proposition, though grand and inspiring, was to them too revolutionary and staggering. How could they suddenly change at another's bidding their precious religious ideal to which they had given their lives, for one which apparently went against their whole nature and training? With them the struggle was hard and long. But who could resist the Swami? He bore them down by the overwhelming power of his intellect and his keen insight into the significance of the teachings and the life and the mission of Sri Ramakrishna, no less than by his burning love for and passionate appeals to them. He interpreted his Master's message in a new light, showing them that their supreme duty lay in the carrying on of the Master's mission, the bringing about of a religious rejuvenation by raising the condition of the masses through service and scattering broadcast the life-giving ideas of the Master over the entire world. The idea of personal liberation, he pointed out, was unworthy of those who believed themselves to be the favoured disciples of an incarnation, for had not their mukti been already assured by that very fact. They were now to arouse themselves and awaken others. That was, said the Swami, the mission entrusted to them by Sri Ramakrishna through him. Finally, however, out of their profound faith in their leader, his brother disciples bowed their heads in acquiescence, knowing his voice to be the voice of their master, all girded up their lawns, to do anything and to go anywhere, for the good of their fellow beings at the bidding of the Swami. As the first fruit of this singular self-abandonment, one whose whole life and soul had been indissolubly merged, as it were, in the ceremonial worship of the Master unremittingly for twelve years, who in his unparalleled devotion to that duty, had never left the precincts of the math even for a single day, Swami Ramakrishnananda went to Madras at the behest of the Swami to open a centre there to propagate the teachings of the Vedanta in southern India. Swami's Sardananda and Abhedananda had already gone to the West at the call of the Swami to help Him in the work there. And full of the same spirit Swami Akhandananda went to the Murshidabad district to start famine relief work for the people dying of starvation there. It may be said here to Swami Akhandananda's credit, that this impulse to be of service to his fellow men had seized him first amongst all his Guru Bhais as early as 1894 when he was in Khetri. He is seen then seeking approval for his intention to open schools to educate the masses. The other Guru Bhais of Swami Vivekananda were also ready to take up, as occasion demanded, any work of religious and philanthropic utility launched by him or to further his ideas and plans of work in India and abroad. Thus gradually came into existence the various monastic centres, sevashramas or homes of service, and the relief centres in times of plague, famine and flood under the charge and with the cooperation of his Gurubhais and disciples.
After his arrival in Calcutta, the increased strain caused by the multifarious demands and activities in the heat of the plains was too much for the Swami. Physicians advised him to take complete rest at once, but at this time he was very busy with plans for a monastery in the Himalayas, with the removal of the math to a permanent healthy site on the bank of the Ganga, and with the founding of a religious and philanthropic organization to be known as the Ramakrishna Mission, which would provide training for his own disciples and instruction for the hundreds of persons that came to him. Besides, his thoughts were with his two Guru Bhais, who were doing excellent work in America and England, from both these countries, he was receiving numerous letters asking his advice and praying for his speedy return to the West, where still larger opportunities were opening up for him. Knowing it would be best to follow the advice of the doctors, the Swami relinquished his work in Calcutta and visits to other parts of India for the time being, and went on to Darjeeling whither Mr. and Mrs. Sevia had preceded him. He was joined by Swami's Brahmananda, Prignatita and Gyanananda, by Babu Girish Chandra Ghosh, Mr. Goodwin, Dr. Turnbull and Messrs. Alesinga Perumal, G. G. Narsimhacharya and Singaravelu Mudiliar. The three last named were his devoted Madrasi disciples of the olden days who had come with him and his party from Madras to Calcutta and were living with him at the mat. In Darjeeling all became the guests of Mr. and Mrs. M. N. Banerjee. Through the generosity of the Maharaja of Budvan, who revered the Swami greatly, a portion of his residence known as Rose Bank was placed at the Swami's disposal for some time. The Swami now gave himself up to complete rest, walking about on the mountain paths, visiting a Buddhist monastery in the neighborhood, rejoicing in the glorious associations of the Himalayas, conversing with his friends, or in hours of silent meditation. While the Swami was the guest at the residence of Mr. M. N. Banerjee, two incidents occurred which give one a glimpse of his yoga powers. There was then living with the family, Mr. Molilal Mukherjee, who later became Swami Satchidananda. At this time, he was suffering from high fever with delirium. The Swami out of sympathy just touched his head. The fever subsided at once and the patient became normal. The same person was a bhakta of the emotional type and often in the course of Sankirtana fell into emotional states in which he would cry and groan and roll on the ground beating his hands and feet against it. The Swami touched him over the heart one day. Thenceforward the whole religious temperament of the man was changed and he became an Advaitin devoting himself to the study and practice of Janana Yoga. Needless to say, he was no longer subject to trances. With the exception of a flying visit to Calcutta to receive the Raja of Khetri, who had come all the way from Rajputana to see him after his return from the West, the Swami was free from work and worry. On the occasion of the Raja's visit, the Prince was sumptuously entertained in the monastery at Alambazar and the Swami held a long discourse with him pertaining to the mission of Hinduism. Raja Ajit Singh and several other ruling princes intended to start shortly for England. The former tried hard to induce the Swami to go with them, but the doctors would not hear of his undertaking any physical or mental labour just then. Speaking generally, the Swami's health was very bad, though at times he felt some of his old vigour and strength. He was cautioned not to exert himself even to the extent of reading, and above all, not to indulge in any deep or serious thought. But to him to be idle was worse than death. After a time he returned to Calcutta for two weeks in order to supervise and settle certain important matters before leaving for Almora for his health. The Swami was far happier at the monastery where he could enjoy the freedom of the monk among his beloved Guru Bhais and his devoted disciples than anywhere else. At this time several educated young men joined the math, 
as a result of their listening to the inspiring words of the Swami concerning Vairagya. He trained them for future work by constant instruction and holding classes at the math on the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedanta. Even during the years of his absence from the brotherhood, four young men had joined the math and were leading the life of Brahmacharya. They were anxious to be initiated into Sannavasa by the Swami himself. For several years they had lived under the supervision of the elder members of the monastery and the Swami, knowing that they were worthy, consented to make them his own disciples. The elder members raised serious objections with respect to one of the four because of his past life. Ellis roused the Swami to the reply, What is this? If we shrink from sinners, who else will save them? Besides, the very fact that one has taken refuge in the math in his desire to lead a better life shows that his intentions are good and we must help him. And even if one is bad and perverted and you cannot change his character, why then have you taken the Gerua cloth? Why have you assumed the role of teachers? Asterisk the Brahmacharis who were initiated into Sannavasa became known respectively as Swami's Virjananda Nirbhyananda, Prakashnanda and Nityananda. Of these the first named had joined the math in 1891, the next to much later, and the last, who was much older even than the Swami, had just done so. The initiation ceremony was very impressive and delighted the Swami more than the huge ovations in His honour. On the day previous to the initiation ceremony, the Swami spoke of nothing but the glories of renunciation, His eyes emitting fire, as it were, and His words of power infusing strength into the aspirants. The discourse, owing to its length, cannot be given here. The Swami concluded, Remember, for the salvation of one's own soul and for the good and happiness of the many, the sannyasin is born in the world. To sacrifice his own life for others, to alleviate the misery of millions rending the air with their cries, to wipe away the tears from the eyes of the widow, to console the heart of the bereaved mother, to provide the ignorant and the depressed masses with the ways and means for the struggle for existence and make them stand on their own feet, to preach broadcast the teachings of the Shastras to one and all without distinction, for their material and spiritual welfare, to rouse the sleeping. Lion of Brahman in the hearts of all beings, by the diffusion of the light of knowledge, the sannyasin is born in the world. And turning to his Guru Bhais, he exclaimed, Remember, it is for the consummation of this purpose in life that we have taken birth, and we shall lay down our lives for it. Arise, awake, and arouse and awaken others, fulfill your mission in life and you will reach the highest goal. You must renounce everything, he continued, you must not seek pleasure or comfort for yourself. All attachment will have to be cut and cast aside. You must look upon lust and gold as poison, name and fame as the vilest filth, glory as a terrible hell, pride of birth or position as sinful as drinking wine. Being the teacher of your fellow men and devoted to the self within, you will have to live to attain freedom and for the good of the world. Can you strive with your whole soul to do these things? Take this path only after serious reflection. There is yet time to return to the old life. Are you ready to obey my orders implicitly? If I ask you to face a tiger or a venomous snake, if I ask you to jump into the Ganga and catch a crocodile, or if I want to sell you to work the rest of your life in a tea garden in Assam as coolies, or if I order you to starve yourselves to death or burn yourselves in a slow fire, thinking it will be for your good, are you ready to obey me instantly? The four brahmacharis implied their assent by bowing their heads in silence. He then duly initiated them into sannyasa. Another initiation ceremony took place at the Alambazar math about this time when mantras were given to Sharat Chandra Chakravarti, a lay disciple, and to a Brahmachari, 
later known as Swami Shuddhananda, who had recently joined the math after hearing the Swami speak on renunciation. To Sharat he said, Arouse Shraddha in yourself and in your countrymen. Like Nachiketa go to Yam's door, if necessary, to know the truth, for the salvation of your soul, for the solution of the mystery of life and death. If going into the jaws of death helps you to gain the truth, you have to do that fearlessly. All fear is death, you have to go beyond it. Be fearless, be ready, from today, to lay down your life for your own moksha and for the good of others. Otherwise what is the use of bearing this burden of flesh and bones? Being initiated into the fiery mantra of absolute renunciation for the sake of the Lord, give away your body for the good of the world, as did the sage Dadichi when the Devas came and told him that the demon Vritra could not be killed with any other weapon but by a thunderbolt made out of his bonisal. Whenever the Swami came to Calcutta for a brief sojourn, he stayed at Balaram Babu's house in Bakbajar, where he and the monastic members of the order always found a ready welcome and warm hospitality. On such occasion it was the scene of the gathering of bhaktas and visitors from all parts of the city. It was in the afternoon of 1st May 1897 that a representative gathering of all the monastic and lay disciples of Slid Ranakrishna took place at Balaram Babu's house in response to the Swami's intimation of his desire to hold a meeting for the purpose of founding an association. He had long thought of bringing about a cooperation between the monastic and the lay disciples of Sri Ramakrishna and of organizing in a systematic way the hitherto unsystematic activities, both spiritual and philanthropic, of his Guru Bhais. When all had assembled, the Swami opened the meeting by speaking in Bengali to the following effect. From my travels in various countries, I have come to the conclusion that without organization nothing great and permanent can be done. But in a country like India, at our present stage of development, it docks not seem to me well advised to start an organization on a democratic basis in which every member has an equal voice and decisions are arrived at by a majority of the votes of the community. With the West the case is different. Amongst us also, when with the spread of education we shall learn to sacrifice, to stand LXWC our individual interests and concerns, for the gutal of the community or the nation at large, then it would be possible to WRK on a democratic basis. Taking this into consideration, we should have for our organization at present a dictator whose orders everyone should obey. Then, in the fullness of time, it will be guided by the opinion and consent of the members. This association will bear the name of him in whose name we have become sannyasins, taking whom as your ideal you are leading the life of the householders in the field of activity of this samsara, and whose holy name and the influence of whose unique life and teachings have, within twelve years of his passing away, spread in such an unthought of way both in the East and the West. Let this Sangha, or organization, be therefore named the Ramakrishna Mission. We are only the servants of the Master. May you all help us in this work. The proposal being enthusiastically supported by all the householder disciples, the future method of work was discussed and some resolutions were passed, laying down the main principles and the aims and objects by which the movement was to be guided. As originally drawn up, they were to the following effect. This association, Sangha, shall be known as the Ramakrishna Mission. The aim of the Sangha is to preach those truths WDIH Sri Ramakrishna has, for the good of humanity, preached and demonstrated by practical application in his own life, and to help others to put these truths into practice in their lives for their temporal, mental and spiritual advancement. The duty of the mission is to conduct in the right spirit the activities of the movement inaugurated by Sri Ramakrishna for the establishment of fellowship among the followers of different religions, 
knowing them all to be so many forms only of one undying eternal religion. Its methods of action are a. To train men so as to make them competent to teach such knowledge or sciences as are conducive to the material and spiritual welfare of the masses. b. To promote and encourage arts and industries and c. To introduce and spread among the people in general Vedantic and other religious ideas in the way in which they were elucidated in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, Indian Work Department. The activities of the mission should be directed to the establishment of maths and ashramas in different parts of India for the training of sannyasins and such of the householders as may be willing to devote their lives to educate others and to the finding of the means by which they would be enabled to educate the people by going about from one province to another. Its work in the foreign department should be to send trained members of the order to countries outside India to start centers there for the preaching of Vedanta in order to bring about a closer relation and better understanding between India and foreign countries. The aims and ideals of the mission being purely spiritual and humanitarian, it shall have no connection with politics. Anyone who believes in the mission of Sri Ramakrishna, or who sympathizes or is willing to cooperate with the above-mentioned aims and objects of the association, is eligible for membership. After the resolutions were passed, office bearers were appointed. The Swami himself became the general president and made Swami Rahmananda and Swami Yogananda the president and the vice president, respectively, of the Calcutta Center. It was decided that meetings would be held at Balaram Babu's house every Sunday afternoon when recitations and readings from the Gita, the Upanishads and other Vedanta scriptures with comments and annotations would be given and papers read and lectures delivered, the subjects being chosen by the President. All these were decided in the two preliminary meetings of the 1st and the 5th of May and the first general meeting of the members was held on the 9th under the presidency of Swami Brahmananda. For three years the Ramakrishna mission held its sittings at the same place. Whenever the Swami was in Calcutta, he was present and spoke and sang. For some time the philanthropic and missionary work was carried on through the medium of this association. In 1899, however, the Swami started a math or monastery at Belur and made over its management to a number of trustees by a deed of trust in 1901, the main objects of the math being the training of a band of monks for self-realization and for the acquisition of a capacity to serve the world in all possible ways. Soon after this math was established as the central seat of the monastic order, the Ramakrishna Mission Association ceased to function as an independent organization and the math authorities themselves carried on the philanthropic and charitable work originally undertaken by the Mission Association. In course of time, with the growth of its scope and public responsibilities, it was felt that for the efficient carrying on of the philanthropic charitable and missionary work, as well as for giving it a legal status, it was better to have a separate organization known as the Ramakrishna Mission. Accordingly, in the year 1909, a society under the name of the Ramakrishna Mission was registered under Act 21 of 1860. The exigencies of the law required certain changes to be made in the rules and regulations of this mission association as originally drawn under the guidance of the Swami in 1897. Most of these changes, however, were of an executive nature, the principles and objects as originally laid down by the Swami remaining the same. The management of the Ramakrishna mission was henceforth vested in a governing body consisting of the trustees of the Belur Math for the time being. The registration of the mission was undertaken to keep the math activities, with the training and maintenance of a band of sannyasins to carry on religious work, distinct from the mission activities. The activities of the Belur Math extended and in course of time various branch maths sprang up in different parts of the country. 
These branch maths and the math at Belur were from their very inception treated as part of a single organization. Side by side with the springing into existence of the branch maths, the Ramakrishna mission extended its sphere of activities and the various philanthropic and charitable institutions that had already been started by it in different parts of India were gradually incorporated into the registered society known as the Ramakrishna Mission, and new centres also began to be started. Though the Ramakrishna Mission and the Ramakrishna Math with their respective centres are distinct institutions, there has been a close association between the two bodies as the governing body of the mission is identical with the trustees of the math and the principal workers of the mission are members of the Ramakrishna math and both have their headquarters at Belur math. But the math and the mission being independent of each other in their respective spheres of activities own separate funds and keep separate accounts of them. Turning now from the proceedings of the inauguration meeting of a semi-public nature, one finds the Swami in the inner circle of his Guru Bhais and disciples, talking about his ideas and intentions in starting this momentous movement. A Guru Bhai having protested that the Swami's ways of preaching, such as lecturing and holding meetings and his ideas of doing works of public utility, were rather western in type and conception and incompatible with Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, the Swami was roused to an apostolic mood and delivered himself thus with great fervour. How do you know that these are not in keeping with his ideas? Do you want to shut Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of infinite ideas, within your own limits? I shall break these limits and scatter his ideas broadcast all over the world. He never enjoined me to introduce his worship and the like. The methods of spiritual petictus, concentration and meditation and other high ideals of religion that lie taught, those WZ must realize and teach mankind. Infinite are the ideas and infinite are the paths that lead to the goal. I was not born to create a new sect in this world, too full of sects already. Blessed are we that we have found refuge at the feet of our Master, and it is our bounden duty to give the ideas entrusted to us freely to the whole world. The Guru Bhai raising no dissentient voice to these words, the Swami continued, Time and again have I received in this life marks of His grace. He Himself is at my back, and is making me do all these things in these ways. When I used to lie under a tree, exhausted, smitten with hunger, when I had not a strip of cloth even wherewith to tie my copina, when I was determined to travel round the world penniless, even then, through His grace I received help and succour in every way. Then again, when crowds jostled with one another in the streets of Chicago to have a sight of this Vivekananda, I have been able, through his blessings, to digest without difficulty all that honour, a hundredth part of which would have made any man go of his head. By the will of the Lord, victory has been mine everywhere. Now I intend to do something for this country. Do you all give up doubts and misgivings and help me in my work, and you will set how, by His grace wonders will be accomplished. The Guru Bhai said, Whatever you wish shall be done. Who are always ready to follow our leading. I clearly see that the Master is working through you. Still, I confess, doubts do sometimes arise in the mind, for, as we saw it, his method of doing things was so different and I am led to question myself if we are not straying from the path laid down by Him. The Swami then said, The thing is this, Sri Ramakrishna is far greater than His disciples understand Him to be. He is the embodiment of infinite spiritual ideas capable of development in infinite ways. Even if one can find a limit to the knowledge of Brahman, one cannot measure the unfathomable depths of our Master's mind. One gracious glance of His eyes can create a hundred thousand Vivekanandas at this instant. 
If he chooses now instead to work through me, making me his instrument, I can only bow to his will. Indeed, it was the Swami among all the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, who saw in the Master not a mere person but a principle, not only the apostle of realization and renunciation, but also of service to humanity in the spirit of worship. Did not the Master fling away the bliss of Brahman to be of service to mankind? Did He not treat all beings as Narayanas, divinities, every moment of His life? Who among His disciples has not seen His unhappiness at the sight of poverty and misery and His touching solicitation for their relief? Who could ever feel like Him, His whole body and soul wrenched, as it were, at the distress and destitution of His fellowmen and at the sight of oppression to men and animals? True, this phase of His unique character was considerably overshadowed by the grandeur of His illuminated personality ever merging in the superconscious state and breaking forth into utterances of wonderful power and charm exhorting all to seek the highest. It was left to His greatest disciple to interpret His Master's life and teachings from all angels. It was the genius of Swami Vivekananda to bring out and emphasize this human side of His Master's nature and to clear away the misconception which prevailed in the minds of many, that renunciation and service were conflicting ideas which could not be combined without detriment to the one or the other. And it was to His glory that He concretized and gave shape to those divine impulses through the institution started under the name of the Ramakrishna Mission for practicing and preaching the Dlayana in its universal aspect, renunciation and service, according to Him, being the twofold national ideal of modern India. Another afternoon, some time later, when the Swami was living at Balaram Babu's house, he was talking in a light mood with some of his Gurubhais and lay disciples of the Master. At these moments he would be very gay, making all sorts of jokes, willing to take as well as give in the battle of wits. One of the Swami's Gurubhais, Swami Yogananda, was taking him to task for not preaching the ideas of Sri Ramakrishna and challenging him to prove how his plans could be reconciled with their master's teachings. For Sri Ramakrishna insisted, above all, on bhakti and on the practice of sadhana for the realization of God, while the Swami constantly urged them to go about working, preaching, and serving the poor and the diseased, the very things which forced the mind outward, which was the greatest impediment to the life of Sadhani. Then again, the Swami's ideas of starting mats and homes of service for the public good, His ideas of organization and of patriotism which were undoubtedly Western in conception, His efforts to create a new type of Sanitsin with a broader ideal of renunciation, and others of a similar nature were incompatible with Sri Ramakrishna's ideal of renunciation and would surely have been repudiated by him. The Swami took these observations of his Guru Bhai at first lightly and retorted in a jocular way, saying, What do you know? You are an ignorant man. You are a fit Chola of Sri Ramakrishna. Like Guru like Chola. Your study ended with Ka, the first letter of the alphabet, like Pahlads, who being reminded by this letter of Krishna, could not proceed further. You are Bhaktas, or in other words, dot sentimental fools. What do you understand of religion? You are babies. You are only good at praying with folded hands, O Lord. How beautiful is your nose, how sweet are your eyes, and all such nonsense, and you think your salvation is secured, that Sri Ramakrishna will come at the final hour and take you up by the hand to the highest heaven. Study, public preaching, and doing humanitarian works are, according to you, Maya because Sri Ramakrishna did not do them himself. Because he said to someone, Seek and find God first, doing good to the world is a presumption as if God-realization is such an easy thing to be achieved. 
as if he is such a fool as to make himself a plaything in the hands of the imbecile. Growing more and more serious, he thundered on. You think you understand Sri Ramakrishna better than myself. You think Juana is dry knowledge to be attained by a desert path, killing out the ten crest faculties of the heart. Your bhakti is sentimental nonsense which makes one impotent. You want to preach Ramakrishna as you have understood him, which is mighty little. Hands off! Who cares for your Ramakrishna? Who cares for your Bhakti and Mukti? Who cares what the scriptures say? I will go to hell cheerfully a thousand times, if I can rouse my countrymen, immersed in tamas, and make them stand on their own feet and be men, inspired with the spirit of Karma Yoga. I am not a follower of Ramakrishna or anyone. I am a follower of Him only who carries out my plans. I am not a servant of Ramakrishna or anyone, but of Him only who serves and helps others without caring for His own mukti. His voice became choked. His whole frame shook with intense emotion. He could not contain himself any longer. Tears streamed from His eyes. Like a flash of lightning, he was up on his feet and ran from the room to his sleeping apartment. His Gurubhais were seized with fear and repented of their criticisms spoken to M.M. in that strain. A few of them followed the Swami, some minutes later, to his room. Entering with cautious steps, they found him sitting in meditation posture, his whole frame stiff, tears flowing from his half-closed eyes, the hair of his body standing on end. He was absorbed in what seemed to them Bhavasamadhi. Nearly an hour, the Swami got up, washed his face and came out to his waiting friends in the sitting room. The atmosphere was too tense for words. Finally, the Swami broke the silence thus. When one attains bhakti, one's heart and nerves become so soft and delicate that they cannot bear even the touch of a flower. Do you know that I cannot even read a novel nowadays? I cannot think or talk of Sri Ranakrishna long without being overwhelmed. So I am trying and trying always to keep down the rush of bhakti welling within me. I am trying to bind and bind myself with the iron chains of Juana, for still my work to my motherland is unfinished, and my message to the world not yet fully delivered. So, as soon as I find that bhakti feelings are trying to come up to sweep me off my feet, I give a hard knock to them and make myself adamant by bringing up austere janana. Oh, I have work to do. I am a slave of Ranakrishna, who left his work to be done by me and will not give me rest till I have finished it. And, oh, Bo shall I speak of him? Oh, his love for me! Swami Yogananda and others fearing a repetition of the above experience gently interrupted him by asking if he would not like to have an evening stroll on the roof of the house as it was too warm in the room. Then they took him up there and diverted his thoughts by small talk till it was far into the night and he was his normal self again. This incident is very significant, exposing as it does the depths of the Swami's inner nature, namely, that of Bhakti, and also as it gives an idea of the tremendous cost at which His Janana and His spirit of service to others had been acquired. The monks of the order ever sought to divert His attention from such tempestuous outbursts, for that would bring Him closer to His real nature, when they knew he would tear off all mortal bonds and soar, through Mahasmadhi, into the region of the Supreme Consciousness of Brahman. Reflecting on such moments in the Swami's life, one of the greatest of his sannyasin Gurubhais has said, You see, the Master has brought us all into this world to keep his, the Swami's, mind diverted to external matters and to his various plans of work, so that he may live long enough to fulfill our Master's mission. Otherwise he may fly off at any time to the sphere of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. 
so profound and convincing was the impression created that never more was any protest made against his plans and methods of work. It was like the clearing of the atmosphere, which had been overhung with clouds of doubt, now and again breaking forth into storms of conflict of ideals. Everyone realized as never before that the Master was at the back of Vivekananda working through him.